Good morning, everyone from, uh, I'd say sunny California. I think the sun's up finally. Um, wanted to just uh, say thank you to Sands for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak to everyone today and um, go ahead and get started here. And let's see what we got. All right. So my talk today is going to be from my perspective uh, as a first time information security officer and really coming from no security background, essentially. Uh, I started out as a uh, political science major at UC Davis, emphasis on peace and war studies, nothing to do with ones and zeros. The whole idea of working in information technology came from a sweet mate I had who had gotten a job in the IT department there on that campus. And they said, well, why don't you apply? We have a role as a technical trainer. And you seem to like to talk at people, um, see how it goes. And so I applied and I got a job in 1996, uh, finally getting paid <laughs> to do uh, computer related work and not sitting down and figuring out networks or programming or anything like that, but speaking to students, staff, faculty about just basic operating system, um, office suite. And then we started to get into the idea of uh, consumer internet. So Mosaic and then Internet Explorer and Netscape Navigator, which uh, I fondly miss those days. That was much more simple back then. <laughs> um, I did then uh, continue on working as a instructor at the UC Davis University Extension. So I would teach classes during the day, uh, and then as well as being a student still. Uh, and then I would go in the evenings into Sacramento and uh, teach night classes to the community. I found that I loved that atmosphere. And I think that's why I probably still remained in a university environment. Um, now working at CSU East Bay. I like being in higher education and academia. Uh, I know I'm not going to be launching rockets or <laughs> curing cancer or anything like that, but I feel that the work that I do uh, promotes those professionals to achieve their goals. And I'm supporting them in uh, the ability to keep their data secure, uh, find the right solutions uh, from a technical aspect. So while I'm not at the spear point of any of those things, I'm supporting them and their teams. And then ultimately in 2005, uh, I got a job at UC Merced, the most current uh, University of California campus. And that was uh, an amazing opportunity coming to a uh, university that starting from scratch. There is no legacy. There is no, oh, this is always how we've done it. They've never done it. So how do we do it? And uh, it ultimately became an issue of, okay, we need to have an information security officer by policy. And our CIO looked around. I was working there. I got hired as a uh, identity management administrator. And they're like, well, I think Greg can do it. And I raised my hand and said, sure, I'll do it. I don't know what that means, but I'll do it. And um, that started the, started the process. So the roles that I carried uh, as information security officer were <laughs> multiple. Um, still continued on as an identity and access management um, administrator. Then I started rolling into IT policy compliance, which means I need to be familiar with federal policy, state policy, system-wide policy. And because UC Merced was brand new, there, didn't have, there weren't policies already in place. So it was kind of my job to write them. And so, okay, sharpened my teeth on uh, technical writing, and plain language and start to develop these things uh, for the campus. Uh, moving into risk assessment, mitigation, so sitting on a number of work groups uh, with a wide spectrum of individuals from our campus uh, risk assessment, from our um, Office of uh, uh, 
um, the OJC, OGC uh, general counsel, uh, police department, fire department, um, campus administrators, and trying to formulate something that was going to stand the test of time for at least short periods as we continue to evolve as a campus. Uh, I was the uh, digital, millennium right, uh, digital millennium copyright agent, which means that all the students that were coming into the campus for the first time and they were thinking, oh, campus internet is going to be super fast. I'm going to download movies and I'm going to download music and that's all illegal. <laughs> so my job was to knock on their doors and say, hi, you're doing something naughty and let's talk about it. And that was also applicable to staff, to faculty, on a couple cases, higher administration. So it came to my shoulders to say, okay, I need to speak to this particular audience and um, you know, let's be friendly, but let's also maintain uh, the reputation of the university and fulfill our requirements uh, as a safe harbor uh, for these types of things. Uh, one of the things I enjoyed doing was being brought into faculty research programs, particularly when they were dealing with uh, government data sets. And so um, faculty would think that they'd be able to get the data, do what they need to do, and then you know, publish their, their work. And that's generally true. However, there is a life cycle to that data, including the research program has completed what are you doing with that data now? Uh, you can't just leave it on your computer. You can't just file the paperwork in a, in a cabinet somewhere. There is a process that you have to deal with to meet the requirements for having the data in the first place. So speaking to those faculty members, building a working relationship, and then ultimately reviewing and having my signature be on that paper to say, this is the agreed upon process. I attest that the faculty member is going to do these things. Uh, so that was exciting and a little nerve wracking. Um, throughout my career, still to this day, uh, I do security training and awareness sessions. And I love that aspect of the job uh, very much because it does get me out in front of people of um, multiple backgrounds, uh, whether it be students, staff, faculty, administrator, and in some cases, community as well. Love that too. I uh, love talking to people about new and current things. And um, I also really like having people ping me to say, hey, this thing came out in the news. Do I need to worry about it? And that kind of you know, makes my heart a little happy because they know that they can come to me and ask me questions and I can work with them and not just uh, shut them down or say, don't worry about it without any sort of background. Uh, and then for, at least in the case of UC Merced, being a new campus, we, the campus was built in Merced, of course, but then we had offices in a couple other cities. And so the idea of information security does have a physical component where access to buildings, uh, to individual rooms, that's part of our larger um, review process. So I would go in and say, okay, we're designing this particular building. We're designing this particular data center. Can you take a look and just give us a, a general security assessment? And we talk about, you know, okay, do the doors have keys? Do they have the, the card locks? Who has access to the, to the um, card lock system? That sort of deal. And so the physical security of things is um, a, a great aspect of information security that I don't think everybody uh, thinks about or promotes as much because again, it's all about down to ones and zeros essentially. But we're in a, a world now where the doors are operating off of ones and zeros too, and it still falls to um, our jobs. So the, <laughs> I, I have these two graphics here. Um, it was amusing to me uh, very early on in my career when my CIO introduced me to the chancellor of UC Merced at the time as uh, a man of many hats. And he had a picture of a hat rack. And I was like, oh, okay, how do I feel about that? And I understood it because I had so many different roles. Uh, depending on the question, depending on who was asking, it would be up to me to decide, okay, what hat am I gonna put on at this moment? 
uh, over time, I started to feel more of a plate spinner in which one thing starts to spin up and that's not going to stop spinning, but now I need to start spinning up something else and something else and something else and something else. You see what I'm getting at? So there became this, boy, there's a lot of things going on that's never going to stop, but I can't forget that last plate or even the first plate that I started with. Everything has to keep going and we're moving forward as we evolve as a campus and we progress as a community and as a system. And all of these things are moving forward together. And I have to be monitoring every single one of those plates, as well as keep space for additional plates coming on because they're not going to stop coming as uh, we move forward. So as I'm sitting there, and uh, the, why I titled the, the talk, Sitting at the Big Table, there was a moment where I was sitting at the chancellor's cabinet. Um, so the chancellor's there, senior administrator, the provost, um, highly respected faculty members, and me. Why am I here? I was like, oh my gosh, do I even belong here? It's like, mm, well, you know what? I am here. What do I do? Do I make the most of it? Yeah, I'm gonna make the most of it. I'm going to say, I have the title, I have the role, people are going to look to me. And when they did, a question came up and every head turned to me and it almost felt like slow motion. Okay, how am I going to answer that question? So I clear my throat and I speak and I think I have like an out of body experience because I don't know where those answers came from but they were the right answers. They were the answers that uh, the people around that table needed to hear, not necessarily wanted to hear. And when I came back into consciousness again, there were some smiles and then they continued on with their meeting. And I was like, what just happened? <laughs> um, so I knew that I needed to have the right information. I'm representing the campus, I'm representing my institution. So if I get something wrong, the reputation of the campus is gonna take a hit. And I can't, I can't do that. I'm supporting my, my university, I'm supporting my institution. But also I'm an individual <laughs> and I need to look like I know what I'm talking about. So how am I going to get there in the first place? You know, how am I going to prepare? How am I going to get all my ducks in a row? It goes from having a general conversation. Uh, I find myself all of a sudden standing in front of a, a large crowd and all those faces are looking at me quietly waiting for me to speak. And it's like, okay, this is gonna be very exciting. <laughs> Much different than what I used to do. The, um, there was a time when the biggest group of people I spoke to was uh, 300 people. And we called that a Meganar back at the time because that was huge. That was before Zoom and that sort of thing, Meganar. And now I look at the number of participants today and it's like, oh, that's, that's a little bit bigger now. <laughs> and then all of a sudden my view comes down to, I'm not just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with anybody. I'm having a conversation that's going to be recorded. Uh, notes are gonna be taken based on my words. So, Okay, let me get my heart back into my chest. <laughs> and let me make sure that I have the preparation done beforehand so that when someone comes up and asks me a question or gives me a, a instant message or a phone call, I'm not scrambling because I haven't heard of anything that they've sp spoken about before. I can say, okay, let me answer that question for you right now. So, I'm only as good as the information I have uh, at access to me. And because we are working in an internet-based job, the answers are there. I just have to find them. So I need to cast a wide net. And then as I draw that net back in, I need to kind of throw out the, the fish I don't need necessarily, but I need to keep what I've gathered, organize it, and then make sure that I'm going to be able to present it to the right groups of people 
in ways that they are going to be able to assess it. I can't do a one size fits all. I have to be able to understand this group over here is doing this for this reason. And it's very different than this group over here. So I need to be able to speak to both of those groups in ways that they understand without having a, a lot of jargon uh, and, and needing any sort of uh, translation or anything like that. So I have to drop out all, a lot of technical terms and be able to have a, a, a conversation with them rather than a lecture. So I consider myself always learning. I am a forever student. Information security, anybody who secures a system, it's almost like taking, I, I equate it to taking a Polaroid uh, picture of something. So I can take a Polaroid picture of an office and I can say, I can secure this office as of when this Polaroid picture is taken. What that means is it's a snapshot because tomorrow that zero day vulnerability that I didn't know existed yesterday is going to be a problem. Uh, it's gonna be a, an issue. I didn't know about it because no one knew about it. So when I say I've, I can secure a system, I can, can secure an office, it's in a moment in time. I have to continually be informing myself about new vulnerabilities, new threats, and gathering that intelligence and being able to, to maintain that. Um, traditional, uh, the old timey classes are still going to be the best. And I'm a absolute mark when it comes to SANS. I love SANS courses. Um, so a little bit of a, a bias there, um, but I love attending SANS seminars, uh, talks, um, going through and sitting in talks that provide CPEs still give me uh, uh, information at that moment. And that gives me more data feeds that I can gather and process. Um, and I have a couple other links there for, you know, there's always the question of well, what certification should I get? That's a good question. I have a GCED, the Enterprise Defender certification from SANS. And that's a great one, um, but everybody's different. So find, you know, the best advice I can give you is find the, the route you want to take and pursue uh, certification in that particular pathway. Uh, in addition, there's constant mailing lists, newsletters, uh, RSS feeds. I do not partake in social media except for LinkedIn. However, I have a number of Twitter feeds um, that I've bookmarked, and I will go and check those when I have the time, but I'm not on Twitter. I don't do Twitter. Um, but I review the Internet Storm Center from SANS. Um, CISA has amazing information. Uh, I have a link to the InfoSec industry there. As well, if you are a information security practitioner in an industry like healthcare or financial technology, they are going to have uh, institution specific groups that probably have their own mailing lists. And I encourage you to get involved in those. Higher education, uh, research and, and higher education institutions have their own and I'm on those. And those are fantastic because they allow for industry specific conversations to occur. It's like, hey, I'm seeing this, are you seeing this? And then there's that collaboration. And it's going to be specific to the groups that you're working with. So it's immediately applicable. It's not, well, gee, I wonder if that applies to you. It, it applies to you because you're in that group. And then of course there's blogs, there's podcasts. Um, I have a bit of a commute <laughs> from where I live to the Bay Area. So I have time to listen to podcasts and I have time to listen to, um, well, I'll say <laughs> I have time to listen to uh, course recordings, which is usually kind of my thing. It's a little, it, it's a little boring, but over the times I can start kind of remember, memorizing things and that helped me get my GCED because I had the time in the car. So I'm gonna listen to uh, course recordings and that worked out very well for me. Uh, there's a quote we have, we drink from the fire hose so you don't have to. 
which means that we're gathering in all this information and we're able to funnel it and uh, analyze it uh, for you. So again, you have all the information, how do you process it? I had to figure out a way of taking good notes for myself, managing those notes in such a way that I could provide that information quickly, and then archiving all that information so that if somebody comes and asks me, you know, hey, did we have this last year or whatever, I have that information. And I don't delete email uh, because I find that even old email is a way for me to track back in many cases and figure out, hey, did we have this conversation before? Did we have this issue before? What was the, you know, um, heat map back then? And we can go through and move forward with that information. And also I put down there knowing to, when to write a memo versus a memoir. Sometimes you don't need to have a 300 page screed about something, just a quick uh, blurb about here is a situation going on. Here's how you can take immediate action. In other cases, yeah, you need to write something a little more involved. And that's only gonna come from knowing the community that you're working with and knowing the information uh, that they need to succeed. Um, I like speaking.io as a good resource for uh, putting together presentations and speaking in public, but there's things like Toastmasters is a good group to get involved in. Um, the uh, courses that SANS have, and I think other people, other speakers have mentioned this one, the um, Hack the Reader, uh, SEC 402 is a fantastic course, uh, but it really comes to knowing the group of people that you're speaking with and being able to speak to them directly in words and ways that they can immediately latch on to without any need of some third party interpreter. Now, do you wanna talk about uh, personal health, physical health, mental health? In this job, there's a lot of hunched down and terrible posture. I'm six foot six, and I find that over time I start leaning forward, my shoulders get all hunched down, and it feels terrible. So I need to breathe, I need to get up, I need to remind myself, I need to balance what I'm doing for work, and I need to balance what I'm doing for my personal self. Standing tables are becoming more popular, and they're fine, but when you can push away from that table, and get up and get out, it's much better. I found amateur radio, in my case, has been a great hobby because it gets me outside. It gets me doing something different from sitting at a computer all the time. I'm now dealing with a different level of technology, doing different things. In many cases, I'm hiking up hills and trying to make connections that way. It's fantastic. Um, there is a Latin phrase, solvitur ambulando, and it is solved by walking. It's attributed back to St. Augustine as the earliest, but a lot of people talk about it. In my case, when I've been sitting hunched over and I'm feeling tired and heavy, working on a problem that I cannot get a breakthrough, I say, okay, I need to go for a walk. I need to change my environment. I need to change my atmosphere. I need to change my view. I need to let my eyes focus away from the two feet, three feet away from the monitor that I've been sitting at for the last four hours. <laughs> I need to get up. I need to get outside. It's important that you maintain a balance as well between your physical self and your mental self. Um, we are known to be in our heads a lot and we worry about a lot. We are concerned a lot and we need to remind ourselves that, okay, I need to just go and breathe. I need to take a walk. I need to get away from this for a little bit and I'm gonna come back to it. You know, we forget to eat sometimes when there's a, a security event going on. We forget to sleep because we're busy. We need to rem remind ourselves that the vessel that we are occupying at the moment is finite and we need to take good care of it. What I've found too is having a good sense of humor is important because at any time, things can get real serious real fast. So, when I push off and say, I'm going to go for a walk, or when people say, hey, where are you going? It's like, 
I'm gonna go for a walk. And there was a time when I kind of felt guilty. It's like those people are all sitting over their computers working. Where are you going? Like, I'm going for a walk. I'm gonna take this moment for myself and I'm going to resolve a problem. But the first like five or 10 minutes of that walk, I'm not gonna think about anything that I've been doing. I'm gonna look at the sky and say, well, what a beautiful shade of blue or gray or whatever. <laughs> Hey, look, I can hear birds singing, that sort of thing. Not think about the, the problem that I've been trying to solve because that's going to creep up on me naturally. Brain's working on it in the background. So in the foreground, I'm forcing myself to focus on nothing related to what I have been dealing with. I'm breathing, I'm walking outside. And then at some point the problem comes back and now I can kind of parse through things much different uh, than I had been previously. And then also coming up with some personal philosophy to deal with issues and problems and stress is important. And everybody can find their own personal philosophy. Uh, for me, it was the uh, Marcus Aurelius, it was Socrates, it was Cicero, those types of things. Processing information in a way that I hadn't been before and Reminding myself of that serenity prayer. And most importantly, I can't fix everything. Here are the things I can fix. And that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a quote from a movie called The Firm. It's Wilford Brimley's character. And he's, he's been worried about a lot of things going on at that point in the movie. And he's told, well, you're, you're being suspicious. And uh, or you're worried about being, you're, you're worried about things that you don't need to worry about, basically. And his quote is, I get paid to be suspicious when I've got nothing to be suspicious about. And that's kind of how uh, a lot of security practitioners that I've talked to feel. You walk into a building and you start looking around. It's like, OK, there's some security cameras there. And, oh, there's an easy to access doorway. And gee, there's some paperwork on that desktop over there. I wonder if that's important. It's important that you not deal with that all the time and think in that way all the time, you do have to give yourself a mental breather. It's gonna be in your best interest overall. So where do I find myself today? Uh, I am information security uh, in the information security office at CSU East Bay. I do a lot of security training and analysis, um, also awareness conversations with our students, our staff, our faculty, as well as community. and. I know that the job I have, the industry that I work in, is not going anywhere. Uh, there was always a talk of you need to have a job that you don't have to worry about robots taking over in, you know, in the future. It's like, well, you know, who's watching all the robots, right? <laughs> Maybe that's us. Um, I like being on the blue team side of information security. I like the idea of being more of a defender rather than that kind of the, you know, the cool hacker guy with his hoodie pulled up and, and you know, sunglasses in the dark, right? That's not me. That's, that's a sexy way of talking about information security, but I'm much more of the, okay, how can I get dropped into this new environment? And how can I defend these people? How can I defend their data? That's what I like about information security. And, it goes back to having that larger balance. Uh, before I found a good balance for myself, boy, there were a lot of late nights. You know, coffee, well, coffee still is, uh, I gotta be honest, coffee still is a major food group. <laughs> um, but I'm now, you know, exposing myself to things like, oh, tea, that's a new thing. But coffee is still the mainstay. I got a big cup of coffee sitting next to me, and it's not my first one for the day. But you have to remember that it's balance. And uh, the best thing that I could say is find the philosophy, find the methodology that suits you the best, whether it becomes uh, information security career or an aspect of your job working in other industries, because it's gonna be in your best interest mentally um, as well as physically over time. And I do want to say that, uh, and other speakers have noted this, we need you. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter who you are. We need you. We need your voice. We need your background. We need you 
to raise your hand and say, I have a question, because it's probably a question that we haven't come up with yet, but that's going to be what shatters the block that we've had in resolving an issue. It's like, we never thought of that before. So I am an introvert. I consider myself a little more on the shy side um, when I'm around people that I don't know. I kind of tend to, to sit back. I guess I'm, I'm also, like I said, six foot six, so I'm not usually sitting at the front of a classroom or an office or whatever, because I know people are staring in the back of my head. So I like to stay back and listen, but it's important to get out there sometimes and raise your hand, ask that question, or say, yes, I will do that job, or yes, I will take on that role. Um, you're going to be welcomed in this industry. We really, really do need you. Um, so I'm gonna be in the hallway. If you have any questions, I'll also link my LinkedIn uh, there. And I will leave you with uh, one of my favorite actors from one of my favorite movies. Good luck, we're all counting on you.